Are we on? Okay. Uh, good evening. Welcome to the February 3rd, 2020 Belmont Select Board meeting. I am Chair Tom Caputo, joined by Vice Chair Adam Dash. Good evening. And Select Board Member Roy Epstein. Hello, everybody. And then Patrice Garvin, our Town Administrator. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, we have a active agenda, but hopefully we'll move through it relatively quickly tonight. Uh, as always, we will start out with community announcements, of which we have a couple. Uh, the first is that uh, Senator Will Brownsberger uh, will speak and ask for feedback on transportation policy this Thursday at 7 p.m., February 6th, uh, in the flat room on the Belmont Main Library uh, on Concord Ave. See sustainablebelmont.net for details. We have an announcement uh, from Bob uh, Upton, uh, who is our veteran services agent. Uh, he provided a copy of this book um, and noted that this book is available. And the book is titled, uh, The Vietnam War 50th Commemoration, A Time to Honor. Uh, the book is available at no cost to any Belmont veteran, uh, a Vietnam veteran, or member of their family to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War and to pay tribute to the Vietnam veterans that lost their lives fighting this war. The book is filled with stories and pictures from ground level personnel, per <coughs> personal perspectives of the men that fought the war and to honor the more than 58,000 troops that died. Please contract Veteran Services, uh, Bob Upton at 617-993-2725 for your copy of this commemorative book while supplies last. And then finally, an announcement uh, on behalf of Adam. You have a, uh, a office hour scheduled oh, yeah. for February the 4th, 6.30. I thought you were saying I'd done something. Yeah, yeah, no. so on behalf no. of Adam with his... Uh, yeah, February, yeah, tomorrow night, February 4th, uh, flat room at the library, uh, 6.30 till 8. I am doing office hours. If you want to talk about events, Belmont, Super Bowl, I'm there. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so uh, next item of business uh, is a opportunity for questions or comments from town residents, and we ask that these uh, are filed with the town administrator whenever possible in advance. Do we have anyone who has nope. expressed interest? Okay. Nope. Uh, anyone who has not expressed interest that intends to speak? Okay, fantastic. All right, then we will move to <coughs> our first order of business, which is a proclamation to honor the 84th year of the Belmont League of Women Voters. And I think we have a number of members of that illustrious group here in attendance. Uh, if you'd like to join us, please, uh, please come to the front. <laughs> we have enough, chair uh, enough chairs? Sure, if you'd like to, that would actually be great. And we'll, we'll read the proclamation and then just. Terrific, if you could turn on the mics there, you can press the button right there on the front. Yeah, it should go green. Excellent. Uh, well, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves, that would be great. I'm Penny Schaefer. I'm currently treasurer of the Belmont League. I'm Amy Grossman, secretary. Ann Covino Goldenberg, longtime member of the league. <laughs> Pat Hawkins, membership. Leonie Lynn Staley, president. Excellent. Well, thank you for uh, for joining us, and it's a, a privilege to be able to uh, uh, provide this proclamation and honor the work. Um, is there anything in particular, Marianne, you'd like to sort of say, or? Would you guys like to say anything? <laughs> We've been busy over the years helping the town of Belmont fund different committees and stuff and encourage people to vote and have candidates night and our voter guide letters going out for the voter guide. We just are very interested in the town government. Yeah, and anyone who's been through any aspect of the process of, uh, of running for any role in town is at one point or another interacted as a member of your audience um, with the great, pa great panels and ed voter education that you do or as a participant in answering your questionnaire and participating in your voter guide. So it's a, it's a great, uh, great asset for the town of Belmont. So thank you, thank you for all that you do. Um, there is a proclamation that has been um, prepared that uh, I would like to read. <coughs> I will, uh, I will give it a shot. <clears throat> so, the Town of Belmont, Massachusetts, Select Board Proclamation. So, whereas we are celebrating the 84th year of the League of Women Voters of Belmont and the 100th anniversary of the League of Women Voters of the United States, 
Whereas the League of Women Voters, open to women and men, is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active particip participation in local government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. Whereas the League of Women Voters of Belmont has been the catalyst for the following Town of Belmont policies and programs, support of education, educational special needs, Chapter 760, and METCO, survey of seniors' needs and support of the Senior Center, support of affordable housing, support of the acceptance of the Community Preservation Act, support of open spaces in Belmont, support of sensible marijuana laws in Belmont, support <coughs> of regionalization of services, support of consolidation of town departments and the hiring of professional managers, including a town administrator. Whereas the League of Women Voters of Belmont provides education of voters and town meeting members about issues and candidates with the Voter's Guide, first published in the local newspaper and now mailed to every household in Belmont, which includes a statement by every candidate on the ballot. Whereas the League of Women Voters of Belmont sponsors and promotes the following events, Candidates Night, held for both statewide and town candidates to present their platforms to the Belmont community and to answer questions. Rise to the polls on election day. Brown bag lunches to discuss issues facing the town and the warrant briefing. Whereas the League of Women Voters of Belmont has generously donated to various town organizations recognizing leadership and citizenship. Now therefore, be it resolved that the select board of the town of Belmont joins with the town to honor and congratulate the League of Women Voters of Belmont in the 100th anniversary and year of the women's right to vote and <clears throat> commends the League for its significant contributions to empowering voters and making democracy work. Tom Caputo, Chair, Adam Dash, Vice Chair, Roy Epstein, Member. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Great, great milestone. Can we, do, can we do a photo? Sure. Sign that for me. It's, it has to do with the census. I just need you to sign. Yeah. Thanks. Right it's just the, yeah, it's the meets and bounds of the town. You're just verifying it. What's the date? Third. Third. So say so, you know the it was at a Belmont Women's Club lecture, and they were saying how the, uh, the the history on the history of the women's suffrage movement, how the League of Women Voters came out of that movement, which is uh, obviously the suffrage being the hundredth anniversary, which is why the League is at its hundredth anniversary yeah. nationally, and. They do a very good job of nonpartisan advocacy for uh, voting. So. Yes. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you for keeping that tradition alive. Thank you very much. Okay. So next item on the agenda uh, is vote to call the presidential primary election on March the 3rd, 2020. Just, I think a, just a small matter. Just a small matter. <laughs> I think uh, Ellen Cushman, our town clerk, is joining us. And that's what this is, the original. So. Excellent. Yeah. How are you this evening? Busy. Good. Yeah. Great. 
Uh, so I'm um, Ellen O'Brien Cushman. I am the town clerk, and um, I'm asking you to call the election, which is a legal requirement. You have to sign a warrant that uh, allows the election to take place in Belmont. And um, if you don't mind, I am going to take a, a moment to send something out in hopes that people are watching. Is that okay? Go for it. Okay. So uh, this is for the presidential primaries. Um, there are four parties uh, holding um, selections for their candidates, and they are all happening on March 3rd. Um, and the four parties are Democratic, Republican, Libertarian, and Green Rainbow. Those all have candidates, and so if you are inclined in any one direction or another, please know that you should um, make yourself aware of all of those candidates before that date. Um, the polling will take place on March 3rd at our usual polling locations, and there are eight precincts. If you don't know where you are registered to vote, if you are not sure if you are a registered voter, there are lots of portals um, to choose to figure out. Uh, we put it in the newspapers, we put it on the website. Um, one great one is wheredoivote.com, um, and uh, there's a whole series of these. You can check on through the website of the town clerk's office and uh, through the state and find out where you are registered to vote. You have uh, the ability to change your party, change your name, change your address, anything like that, up until February 12th at 8 p.m. After that, there are no changes to the voting list, and it is as it is. So uh, if you are interested in becoming a registered voter, I urge you to act quickly. So um, polls are open from 7 in the morning until 8 p.m., and people should not be surprised that this is not uh, only for the presidential preference um, election. It also has a state committee man and a state committee woman for the second Suffolk and Middlesex, which is um, the Belmont Senatorial District, as well as our town committees, the Democratic Town Committee and the Republican Town Committee. Those are all elected at the presidential primary. So that's first. Excellent. Second, uh, the legislature has broken with its prior tradition and called uh, for early voting for five days preceding the presidential primary election. And those are open from February 24th to February 28th. And I have just um, submitted all of my hours for there, but people should know that we have, out of those five days, two of those days will be long and they'll start at eight in the morning and they end at 7 p.m. Um, we have noticed from past um, attendance at early voting that people just aren't seeming to take the four to eight um, opportunity as much as we anticipated. So that's why we're only doing two nights instead of three or four. I need my staff to be ready to go um, on election day. So it's for us, it's basically running five elections in a row and then we run another one four days later. Um, but so people should pay attention to that and it is only going to be held here. Early voting is only available here at town hall. And last time we had this, we did have some people get very confused and they thought that because they could early vote here at town hall, they could vote on election day here at town hall. So I ask people to know that the early voting is only here at town hall, but on election day, if you choose to vote, you go to your original polling place, um, any of those eight places. Um, I also need to tell you that absentee voting is available right now if you are going to be out of Belmont on election day or you have a conflict because of your religious observance or um, you have a medical or disability, um, you can come and vote. Those are very specific reasons that are allowed by the Massachusetts Constitution and those people can vote uh, by absentee or request a ballot to be mailed to them if they cannot uh, get out, that's not a problem. Um, but early voting is really no excuse absentee voting. Any voter of Massachusetts is eligible who is uh, registered to vote can uh, vote that way. And then lastly, uh, I am, for anybody who's interested in high schoolers and what we're up to in terms of voter registration dives, drives, I am going to be down at the high school with uh, the community service um, coordinator, Alice Melnikoff. Um, and our usual, we do this before every election, and this particular one is February 10th. Uh, at uh, the lunchtime periods to register anybody who's uh, down there um, or make any changes or answer any questions. And lastly, if you have any questions, you can always talk to the town clerk's office at 617-993-2600 uh, or send us an email at townclerk, all one word, at belmont-ma.gov. Thanks for letting me cram that in. Excellent. And I have one more after you've done your motion to sign. <laughs> can I ask one question? Yes. Do you have to vote based on party affiliation? Or yes. 
So if you are a member of a party, of the, any of those four parties that I mentioned, you must vote at the primary. You must vote according to that, and that's the only ballot you're eligible to get. If you are an unenrolled or unaffiliated voter, which in Belmont is more than 9,000 out of our, our 19,000 voters are unaffiliated, uh, those people, when they arrive at the primary, may choose which ballot of the four that they want to uh, vote, and it does not affect their voter um, registration. And we also have 25 De, you know, uh, political designations and they haven't risen to party status, those people have the same privileges as a person who's unaffiliated. Yeah. Well, efficient as always. Four <laughs> elections, yes. <laughs> yes, I keep wanting your pen. Uh, okay, can we get a motion then? I would move to approve the warrant for the presidential primary election on March 3rd, mm -hmm. 2020 in Belmont. Do we have a second? Second. Excellent. All in favor? Aye. 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 My other public service announcement, if I might take a moment, yes. is that for the annual town election, which we are running, uh, all of our preparations are happening at the same time, uh, that election is April 7th, and um, town-wide office as well as town meeting members, um, those are available, and town and the nomination papers are due back to my office by 4 o'clock on uh, February 18th. So anyone who is interested, now is the time to uh, jump up and down. If you've been considering running and you just aren't sure, you should just give us a call and we'll take you through the process. Okay? All good. Excellent. Thanks very much. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we will now be going into executive session. Um, and this will be an executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel. And in this particular case, it's the town administrator. But we will need a roll call vote to do that. Um, I, yeah. motion. I move to enter executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to collect, condu conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel, town administrator. Second. Okay, Adam, roll call vote. Adam Dash, aye. Tom Caputo, aye. Roy Epstein, aye. Excellent. All right, we will be back.
All right, we need to come out of executive session. I move that we come out of executive session. Second. Uh, roll call vote. Adam Dash, aye. Tom Caputo, aye. And Roy Epstein, aye. Excellent. Okay, the next item on the agenda was a uh, tentative vote to ratify town administrator's contract. Uh, we are continuing that uh, discussion with the town administrator, so we will push that off to a future a date. Uh, so next is a discussion of the Financial Task Force 2 update. So you, 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 you yeah, want to so, um, summarize and I'll provide sure, some color? Sure, the superintendent and I have um, felt that we should give kind of a dual kind of update to each board, the school committee and obviously the select board. So I, we wrote up, uh, John wrote up a brief uh, memo um, and I'd like to read it so the public could kind of hear okay. what's going on. So the Financial Task Force 2 is the follow-up committee to the Financial Task Force 1. The Financial Task Force 1 committee met from 2013 to 2014 to outline the financial planning strategies for the town of Belmont. This includes forecasting a five-year plan and outlined the revenues and expenditures that make up the town's budget. This work was the backbone of the 2014 operating override that the town has benefited from over the past 2015. five years. Yeah, 2015. Similar to the Financial Task Force 1, the Financial Task Force 2 committee is made up of elected officials from the Select Board, School Committee, members of the Warrant Committee, Capital Budget Committee, as well as the town treasurer and members of the school department, myself, um, and a couple other members of my department. The first meeting of the Financial Task Force Committee was on December 10th, 2018, and the group has been meeting consistently for over a year. To review the Financial Task Force One report and work completed, review the financial assessment conducted by the Collins Center, who was hired by the town with a grant to provide feedback on Belmont's financial planning process, and the Financial Task Force 2 group took those recommendations from the Collins Center and customized the tool to blend in the town's planning process. The Financial Task Force 2 committee supported the work of the schools and the town on the FY21 budget process and will continue to meet and discuss the strategy for the five-year town school budget plan. In order for the town and community to be more informed, the school committee and the select board will be updating the work of the Financial Task Force 2 committee over the next few months. So this is something that we, um, were asked to put on the agenda every select board meeting to give an update from the financial task force. The other thing I wanted to mention that Chris has been working with um, Belmont Media is they're gonna be segmented and parceled out. So if somebody wants a full update for every meeting, they can just kind of watch it continuously and they don't have to watch hours and hours of select board meetings to get to it. Uh, <laughs> that's a good idea. Hey, wouldn't you have a timeline when we're going to hear from them? The financial task force too? With like so a we're currently working on what the override number is. Mm -hmm. we're, we're still kind of narrowing that down. I think we have a, a probably a month worth of work left on that. And once we have that, we'll be updating at town meeting. Yep. And then I think from there. We're getting an yeah, update. so I would say the next couple of uh, meetings of the financial task force <laughs> will be specifically around the five-year financial plan. Um, and to put a little context around that, we're working with the schools as well as each of the town departments uh, to understand what a level services budget looks like. And level services, the concept there, it's about not necessarily level funding, but what level of funding is required to maintain the level of services, mm -hmm. uh, which is particularly relevant in the schools with growing enrollment, you, know, you need to increase the budget just to maintain level services, as well as what is the kind of desire of uh, the various different town departments um, to continue to further improve their, uh, their programs and uh, their offerings to the community. We're going to put all of that together into ultimately a five-year plan, which is sort of a, a base case, and then ultimately uh, a, broader, uh, a broader ask for the community uh, to consider. So. That work happens over the next month or so, and I would say around the end of February, we need to find time to sit down with this group and provide a more detailed rundown of sort of where we are and, and have a dis uh, more detailed discussion. So, and to add to that, so my office developed a matrix for each department to fill out, and it's listing their top five priorities and how they suggest um, deal addressing those needs that they need in their department uh, and uh, cost and then we are going to plug that in and look to see if what the impact is for a five-year um, forecast. So, and then the task force is gonna take that information and kind of whittle down the, the priorities and see what's really needed and go from there. So. so Tom, what is the work product from the committee? Is it a spreadsheet or a written report or multiple. a memo? Or? There'll be multiple work products. So I say the near-term work product is going to be a, a spreadsheet, but 
but probably well with some summary uh, assumptions as to what goes into that mm -hmm. and the choices that were uh, elected in various different scenarios so you can take a look at that and then what ultimately will be uh, kind of the, the a culmination of the efforts will be a selected sort of five-year recommendation um, guidance to this group uh, obviously with some input along the way as to what uh, size override um, uh, would be recommended and then some specific set of recommendations for things that we would like to recommend and encourage the town to address in the next in the coming years whether or not that be specific initiatives around revenue costs or sort of and then length of, of time we feel the override will cover i think it's a great point right now the we're amount as well as the structure right of the, the way the matrix works right now it's five years and obviously that's going to have to be discussed and, and kind of nar narrowed down a little bit because obviously we can't fund everything so but the first product for this group to engage around will be uh, basically uh, spreadsheets, spreadsheets and right. scenario planning yeah. Okay. opportunities looking forward to it yeah good it's, work uh, it, it is it is big work and uh, I think we're gonna have uh, a lot of community education to do over the next you know whatever it is 10 months leading up to November and our uh, kind of commitment is both at the school committee as well as the select board uh, meetings to provide updates regularly as to the status to start to begin that education process yeah. good well thanks for doing the work absolutely Anything else? Nope. Okay. All right. We need an update on the sad story associated with the Lime Bike. bike. Yes. Their choice, not ours. Yes, their yeah. choice, not ours. So, Lime Bike um, is out of business. Um, they are a doc. They were a dockless um, bike sharing program. Uh, people probably saw them around town. They were lime green. Um, lime Bike is moving towards more focus on e-scooters. And this initiative for the town of Belmont came through the MAPC, um, Massachusetts Planning Council. So since MAPC's agreement um, is ending, there's no options for a bike share program in the town of Belmont. Um, or bikes, other towns. Or other, well, yeah. So off street. Well, yeah, just to clarify, I don't think they're going out of business per se, right? They're, they're ch changing they're, their they're, they're changing their business model. Out of business bit, right now, and right. And they're actually picking certain geographies and they're picking Correct. different modes of transportation. but. Bicycles in the Boston area is not one of them. Correct. And yeah. Right. So um, bikes are currently off the streets for the winter, so if anyone happens to stumble across a bike, uh, let us know. <laughs> um, as I said, line bikes moving into scooters. What we don't know is um, if they do go to an e-scooter program, whether or not that means the town would have to pay into that. We don't know if dock, dock station is going to be required, which kind of puts a whole other level of complexity to it. Um, so there's a lot of discussion about what the town wants to do um, well, in regards would, to That'd bike. be a big discussion because we never agreed to do scooters. Correct. So it's really just, um, we kind of have to wait and see. Yeah, I always thought that the uh, Lime Bikes business model was a little problematic because <laughs> it wasn't possible to ride, to take one of the bikes and ride it to downtown Boston, right. which was a principal destination. So is there any possibility of, expending, of extending the Blue Bike program from so Cambridge out to here. We talked about that, and the Blue Bike program right now is being sponsored in Boston through, I believe, Blue Cross. Yeah. So if we could find a sponsor for the town of Belmont, we might be able to. But again, that I think that a, has a dock to it, and whether or not the town would have to pay. So those, those things would have to be worked out. I know that Blue Bike is looking to expand into other communities, so mm -hmm. we have to just kind of get some more information on it. If the board is willing to engage Blue Bike, we can certainly look into that. Is the, can that be done through the MAPC? I'd have, we'd not, have to call in. I think that out. would be the yeah. best, because obviously the line bike program was a bunch of towns, it wasn't just us. Correct. And MAPC did the discussion, we just signed into it. Correct. Yeah. So I mean, I'm assuming that other towns in the line bike program are in the same boat as us, and they probably got some Right, but if we do have to pay for Blue Bike, it's, uh, then it's a matter of finding, obviously, the, the dollars to do that and given our it all depends on what it is and where it is and where the docks go that's a whole and the big docks are a, the docks are a big conversation yeah if there's one in front of my building in yeah. somerville i understand yeah. Yeah. so that's the the update um i'll have more information once um, we look into blue bike a little bit more yeah that's it is a bit of a shame yeah because it was very popular we got it good was, data on that it was yeah. it was increasing ridership was increasing yeah. over time right can't make them do it. Lack of a business model, though, will doom you. A profitable business model will doom you every time. <coughs> uh, okay. We're all set there? Yep. 
All right, next up is an uh, update from the uh, Recreation Commission. And I see we have uh, Our two visitors. John and Anthony, <laughs> uh, our Assistant Town Administrator and our rec uh, Recreation Commission Chair. If you would uh, introduce yourself, that would be great, and then uh, we'd love to hear an update on the work. Sure. Anthony Ferrante, Rec Commission Chair, ready for my updation. <laughs> updation, that's <laughs> perfect. Uh, John Marshall, Assistant Town Administrator, Recreation Director. So you want to take a lead on this, John? Or? Sure. Um, so uh, a couple of updates. Um, probably uh, most recently we've had some conversations around um, tennis courts and trying to find solutions with um, the decision that the school uh, department uh, made regarding tennis courts up at the high school. Um, I had had several conversations with Superintendent Phelan, um, had had a couple of conversations with the Recreation Commission, uh, most recently, um, the last commission meeting, uh, we had a conversation uh, about the possibility of adding a court at Winbrook. Um, certainly there's support from the Recreation Commission um, to look at designs to figure out exactly what can fit out there and then um, kind of moving forward from there. But I think the first step that and correct me if I'm wrong, Anthony, but the first step is really kind of having a design to see what fits in that area. From a really high level view, um, it looks like potentially one or two courts in between where the Winbrook tennis courts currently are, the four courts, and um, Joey's playground. Mm -hmm. um, but without really having someone come out and look at that area, it could be one or it could be two. But that's really the next step that um, the commission wanted to explore. And I would see this as a multi-step process. So a real top-level design, can you actually fit one or two new courts there? Um, and then I would see this following kind of the model for CPC projects generally. Um, so a design phase where there's an actual, you know, a phase one for planning and, uh, and uh, construction design, and then a phase two where you would actually implement it. Um, so we have not yet taken a formal vote on any of this since we, <laughs> we don't even have the top level design, but I think um, it has been discussed and I'm at least favorable. Uh, um, but, yeah. I don't want to speak for everybody. I thought the CPC was going to um, inquire, I guess, at the state level whether uh, CPC money could be used to construct a new court. Is, has that been resolved yet? Unless the rules have changed, I assume we can construct a new court. Uh, the courts at uh, Winbrook, Grove, and PQ are all done on CPC money, CPA money. The rehab, just wanted to make sure that, constru that new construction was also permitted. We can run that down. Yeah. Yeah. We have let the, um, we do have a representative uh, on the Recreation Commission, um, David Kane, who's on the CPC committee. Um, we've also, um, I've reached out to Floyd Carmen uh, to let them know uh, about that, and I know that they are, looking into it, but um, it's our understanding because it is on park property. Uh, I know sometimes the fields up there, Winbrook School, the, the parks, um, that is park property where the playground and the courts were built previously, so that shouldn't be an issue um, with it. And because it is a new court and not renovating an existing court, it should meet those two criteria. But again, we have to make sure that that um, does fully meet that. I mean, the Community Preservation Coalition has been good at about answering questions like that and staying mm -hmm. with the state. Um, yeah, I was at the rec commission meeting the last time as my liaison role and it was a, you know, it was a good discussion, long discussion about this and some of the tennis proponents were there. And my understanding is the commission sort of, they didn't, they voted to do, to explore doing up to two courts additional there, mm -hmm. pending obviously having room and all the rest, so. But it was, <coughs> it was unanimous. <clears throat> That's great. I, I think this makes a ton of sense. I think it's absolutely something we should explore, and particularly in light of some of the decisions that were made on the high school campus. This seems like a good sort of town-wide solution to kind of provide uh, opportunities for uh, not only recreation residents, but potentially provide some support for the, the high school program, which I think is great. You said, uh, Anthony, it was a, it was a kind of a two-step process. Are you envisioning it's going to take place over multiple CPC years, funding years, or could you do it as a phase one, phase two in the same year? So I haven't. The second phase only initiating if the first is successful. I haven't been on the CPC for two years, so I may have my facts a little bit uh, off. But so the, fir the very first step, I think, is, is a, a real top level design, which I, I think 
isn't even really a design. It's somebody mapping it out and saying, yes, you can fit right. something of this area in that site. Um, and that could happen quickly. Uh, but yes, the way these CPC projects have been going in recent years is you have a, a phase one in, a, in, in year one um, where, uh, where the plans and are, are drawn up and you have a real, you have real construction documents, you have real bids mm -hmm. um, so that you actually know the price and then you go to town meeting with, with, the, uh, with the full project in the subsequent year. Um, I believe it is possible to do that planning. Um, CPC has an administrative budget, so they might be able to do that, but that would really be a question for them. And if you did that, you could, you could potentially jumpstart this. I mean, that would be my thought. I know in the past I sat on the CPC for, for a year and did see some of this take place. I think when you had probably more complex and larger projects where you really didn't know what the cost would be and you had a fair bit of design that had to take place, I think that was the natural approach. I also think in a few of those cases there was a fundraising component that was anticipated and you had to kind of bake in some time to do the fundraising and to put all of that together. I don't know whether there would be a fundraising no, the, component I here. Yeah. Current, uh, speaking as a member of the CPC, the current philosophy is not to have a fundraising requirement for something that's on public land. Right. So in that case, that would remove that complexity. So. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it sounds like it'll be something that ultimately goes to the CPC and we're not in the, you know, an opportunity to do it for this town meeting, so it would be obviously be next and there's time to do it, but I guess I, for one, would love to see it happen as quickly as possible. It would be possible if you, if you, um, an application can go, can go into the next regular cycle. So that's due, I think the preliminary ac applications are due September maybe? September, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's, that should be fairly straightforward. Great. So I think the intent would be working with Superintendent Phelan, uh, myself, and uh, Jay Marcotte, the Public Works Director. Um, we would work together to try to submit something, um, reviewing it with the Recreation Commission first, but having something submitted for the next cycle. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, yep, and then the, uh, the other update, um, so we are, um, as everyone, or as the three of you probably know, we've been, um, since I started, and actually even before I started, having conversations about cost recovery and the recreation department, um, moving forward to uh, potentially an enterprise fund. Mm -hmm. um, the Recreation Commission has had some initial conversations. We've been discussing the um, ability to recover our costs. What does that look like? We've been doing some forecasting and some mapping. The Recreation Department has. Um, you know, our intent is to go back and give a further update to the Recreation Commission. Um, but I think the conversations we've had recently um, is how do we work on um, space and kind of the timing that we're in right now. That's probably the biggest challenge um, for moving the recreation department to fully cost recovery is having enough space so that the volume of what we're offering um, <coughs> really keeps the costs effective for residents in the community. Um, since I started, that's probably been the biggest challenge is space. Um, I seem to have uh, come in at a time where fields are a premium, gyms are a premium. So um, trying to kind of quantify that as, as we've been struggled with space has been a little bit of a challenge. Um, but the conversations that I've had with um, the chair um, and the commission um, was that I do think it makes sense to move into um, a mechanism like an enterprise fund where we can identify the true costs. Um, I've worked in another number of communities where it's not necessarily, um, and, and I know this is difficult, but in year one or year two or year three, based on what we have for space, it might not be um, able to fully recover those costs. Uh, I also think there's a a philosophical question in terms of how much are we trying to recover by program that we have to do a little bit more work on but um, certainly in the intent would be to move forward into an enterprise fund in the near future <coughs> recognizing that it might have to be subsidized for a couple of years until we can acquire more space and build out the programs uh, we have done a very good job of strategically 
Um, looking at the recreation department, um, we had a admin assistant that we promoted to a program coordinator um, and Chris Costello, who has been able to um, increase the amount of programs that we've offered. Just recently this um, fall and spring, we created 20 new programs um, to be able to offer to the residents of Belmont. Um, we have a office manager who's retiring, who's been with the town for uh, a number of years, uh, who has done a terrific job. Um, instead of replacing that office manager position back, we will have a assistant uh, recreation director coming in. So another person that we think can really change the uh, dynamics of the department and move us um, into um, a growth pattern in terms of the programs and services that we offer the residents. So um, great opportunities right now. Uh, again, just the biggest challenge I think we have is that space for the next few years and identifying the right space um, that might be out there for us really to take off in terms of what we do. And this is the fourth really step in the plan that we've outlined a while ago. The first being obviously taking rec out from a BPW. That was not step number one. Step number two was finding a rec director in John, which is what we did. Step three is the restructuring of his department. Step four is to create the enterprise fund. And then se step five is to self-sustain self it. So this is part of a bigger plan. John, is the space constraint something that will go away when the high school is completed, or is this a permanent issue? Um, <laughs> so when the high school is completed, we will have access back into the uh, Higginbottom pool and the field house. Um, which is, those are two very important spaces for us to be able to access. Um, there's also, uh, we've been very fortunate to have received additional time up at the Beach Street Center to be able to offer programs, um, as well as the schools have been terrific in trying to find some temporary space for us in the elementary schools um, to utilize their gyms. Um, it's just not the same as the space up at the field house or the Higginbottom pool. Those are two um, important pieces for us. But I think if there was another opportunity in town somewhere um, to- Which we've identified. We, we wanna take over the police trailers once they vacate and move into their new building and we want to have it used for recreation. So I think there are some initial conversations that we need to have with We need with to talk that. to the neighborhood, obviously. We need to talk to the boards to see if everyone's on board. But it's an opportunity to really increase the space um, for, the, for the rec programs in town. I would also just add we've made a lot of progress in, uh, in coordinating with the schools. Um, we're kind of forced together by the construction project. And I think it's important to keep that momentum going um, because if you really want to go to a self-sustaining rec program and, and add to programming, I think the better we coordinate with the schools to fully utilize the spaces we have, the better off we're going to be as a community. Mm -hmm. I think the other goal too is to entice the communities around us to really want to invest in, in some of the programs as well, to really make it something that is attractive to everybody. We have to make sure the fees obviously stay affordable, that people will actually enter in the program, otherwise there's no point, so. Right, we don't want to make it self-sustainable, but then no one signs up. <laughs> right, because it's too expensive, right. so it's a, it's a tough. Correct. I, tough I think, road. like anything, the, the more volume that we can drive, the more programs we can offer, the more spaces that we can have for people to participate, um, that will really help with the fees in terms of how we set them. I think that's probably the biggest hurdle and challenge over the next couple of years is we really can't build out um, with the space constraints that we're over um, or we're under, uh, but um, certainly something we're working towards and we're identifying every program we can add and any type of niche opportunity um, you know we can get our hands into at this point. And I will say since John has come on, REC has become much, uh, much better in, in regards to its future and, and what we can provide to the community. So. Yeah, and actually it re requires at least more thought on my end that uh, I'm not sure that it's appropriate to uh, or necessary to have REC to be completely self-sustaining and covering its own costs. But, it, but it, I think it's appropriate to have a price that's more than zero, just because that's kind of the best way to gauge what the true demand for an offering is, is to charge something for it. But it doesn't necessarily have to be the whole cost. 
Right. And I think that's the, the greater dialogue with the Recreation Commission and the Select Board. Um, in terms of cost recovery, um, cost recovery is kind of like a philosophy in terms of how you look at what you're generating for revenues for programs. Um, that could be 100%, that could be 100% plus indirects, that could be, you know, it, it is a number that I think we have to drill down on a little bit more. We've certainly done some preliminary mapping in terms of what those things can look like. Um, but that is a, I think, a philosophy question. Recreation departments are services in the community. At the same time, they operate like a business. So that is that. Yeah, and there's also the additional capital that you're gonna need when, as you're using certain spaces and facilities, because if you're using them at a greater or higher rate, you're gonna, your capital needs are gonna increase over time, and what is that, what is that responsibility of the town? That, those are all discussions we need to have. And even within, I would imagine, a program, you can decide whether or not a particular uh, program or sport or activity is in and of itself self-sustaining. You, you subsidize some, you make a little bit on the others, and then in aggregate the enterprise fund balances. But you know you can kind of adjust programs based upon demand and cost and other other things, right? So there's well, that would be the right. goal. I yeah. mean, whether it's it's achievable or not, well, I guess we'll find out. But I think the goal is laudable, certainly. But a lot of other local communities do, in fact, have self-sustaining enterprise funds, correct? Yep. For, for recreation. Well, that's recreation, good. yeah. And and again, it's kind of a question of what does that look like, right? Yep. So what might happen in Brookline might be different from Arlington and different <coughs> from Lexington. They, all three of those communities operate out of an enterprise fund. Um, when I was in Arlington, we didn't charge indirects back to the enterprise fund, but we recovered health benefits and things like that. So I do think it's a greater conversation as we move forward with this um, in terms of building that up what goes into making up that pie, and so what do we feel is appropriate for the, the town of Belmont? So what is self-sustaining exactly. then? I mean, you can sort of manipulate what you count to make it self-sustaining if that's the way you want right. it to go. But I do think it's worth noting, and I know the Financial ta Task Force has picked this up a little bit as one of their ultimate recommendations. It was in the first Financial Task Force, and the second is sort of, I think, gonna double down on this. You know, the nice thing about some of these opportunities is that they not only can provide benefits to the community and sort of much needed opportunities for recreation or adult education, what have you, they can be revenue generating, right? So it can be, in some sense, if done right, a win-win where you're providing services and yet you're, you know, making sure those services are covered by, uh, by the fees as opposed to being a drag on taxes. Mm -hmm. and, and I, applaud, I, I applaud what you're working on. That's great. So we, we oh. hope to bring it to annual town meeting, the enterprise fund article to establish. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's Funding it is a different question. I was going to say, so yeah, the next question then will be is how much is the general fund? No, we were talking about establishing it, baby steps, establishing it this year, funding it next time. Well, we did that with that stabilization fund, um, the, yeah. the, the general stabilization fund. We created it. We didn't put any money into right. it until the next year. Yeah. So. Right. It is a two-step process. So in talking to um, Steve Cirillo um, with the Collins Center who helped with the yep. financial model, um, his thought was to establish it and then fund it in the following year, whether it was a fall spring type thing or a spring the following spring. So um, we're kind of moving forward in the right direction with that. I if that's a two thirds or majority vote. I don't know. That's a good, that's a good question. I'd have to look at the statute. Stabilization is two. Th yeah, it's just a statutory thing. The statute. This statute. Saying, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, this is great. Right. Great. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Much needed uh, to see uh, movement. So it's good to see you guys are moving it along. So next is our discussion on the Claflin Street parking passes and whether or not we yeah. want to increase the number of parking passes. So this um, there's a request Crazy from the town treasurer to increase the number of spaces um, by four to 80. Yeah. I was looking at our minutes from Feb from December 2nd when we were going, I was going through my packet and it said that, that at that time we were talking about going from 75 to 80 and now the treasurer's email says we have 76 passes. Yep. I don't know if that's a typo in the minutes it could or. Be. Uh, he, he sent a subsequent email today and he said 76. So. Yeah, I, and that's what the motion is on here. I'm just saying that we, the minute said 75. It could, probably, it could be a typo. Um, how does this impact the parking for the general public in Belmont Center, I guess, is my question. I mean, it's only a you know, handful, it's a four spaces, it's not a lot, but I mean, impact on the farmer's market, impact on the general parking, because it's taking parking away from other people, right? right? And 
putting it to the people who buy bypasses. No, I think the intent here is that the uh, there are there are unutilized spaces regularly yeah. in Claflin, so by opening up additional monthly passes, you hopefully remove some people off the side streets. Correct. Mm -hmm. No, I get it, and we can but generate but some revenue as well, such yep. as it Yeah, does. but it, it doesn't seem like there's really any downside as far as uh, shopping for the stores, whether the farmer's market has an impact. I mean, in the worst case, um, we're talking about a couple of Thursdays in the year, and I guess in the worst case, four people go back on the streets if there's really a space constraint. But well, not if they bought a pass already for six well, months. But we've looked during the some farmer's market and there's always space. Does this lease some flexibility to add more passes if the Macy's Foodies location ever gets leased out in the next six months? But it doesn't, it doesn't talk about the farmer's market. Are these in the back where the farmer's market is? Where he's requesting the for He hasn't indicated. Oh, you don't know where they are. Where okay, so that may or may not impact that farmer's right. market at all. Is this something you want to try for a year and see, or we? We can do that. If well, we can like always to adjust it too, right? Well, yeah, we, I mean, we can. True. If uh, a year from now it feels like it's not working, we can pull it back down. And right. yep. Yep, yep, yep. It seems that the ideal policy is one where you have exactly one empty space. Yeah, exactly. So if we have 15 empty spaces, then we should. What an economist. Well, yeah, that's right. <laughs> We can start with we'll start with four more for now and All right. and, and take a look. I mean, I'm, I'm satisfied with giving it a flyer and see how it goes. I agree. Um, if I can ask just one quick question, I think last time we talked about this, we wanted to contact uh, the Belmont Business yeah, Center. Yeah, we, we haven't yet. Um, I figured that would be a discussion point. If you want me to do that before you take a vote, we absolutely can. But I mean, additional parking is. I can't imagine the businesses being against. So. I, I, right. I don't know. Mm. You never know. I think. I know we got in ourselves in a heap of trouble a few years ago by not sort of engaging them around this. I don't. I mean, know. I can I give Jerry at Champion Sports a call, and because he can run it through the uh, the business association there, the Senate Business Association. Could vote it on the tenth, real quick. Yeah. Because we're meeting next week. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to. Do I don't want to kick yeah, it out. Be, for, you know, right. It's a useful, you know, courtesy yep. kind of thing. I can contact Jerry. Okay. I just don't. I don't want Floyd to think we're just kicking it down the road and we're trying to wrap it up. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I, I'm supportive. I just I think it's a good courtesy yeah. to let them know. Sure. I think the other one in the past we mentioned was to the landlord as well. To Locatelli? Yeah, uh, Locatelli. Okay. We will I think that's great. And then I think if we could ta tackle it next week, maybe just very yeah. quickly. Okay. It would be extremely quick. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. So, uh, we now have a resignation from the Youth Commission. That's unfortunate. Laura Panos is the uh, only attorney on the Youth Commission. Um, she's been, she's been, uh, from what I understand, attending and very active, and she's a you know, local Belmont resident and local Belmont uh, lawyer. Um, but uh, we appreciate her yes. uh, involvement, and I guess we can replace this, the slot in the open normal course over the summer. It doesn't look like there's yeah. a request to do anything. I think that's right. I mean, the nice thing about the Youth Commission is that to some degree it was over, well, it, it was, was large. It was large. Yeah. Uh, so I, yeah. I would move to accept the resignation of uh, Youth Commission member Laura Panos. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And thank Laura for her service. Yep. Few committee appointments then. We're getting going on a couple of things that have been in the works for uh, a number of months. Uh, Long-term Capital Planning Committee, Economic Development Committee, and the Age-Friendly Advisory Committee. So as in, and John, you can uh, introduce yourself again and walk us through this, but I think the nice thing is that a lot of the uh, participants in this committee are ex officio or otherwise appointed by their board. So it doesn't, doesn't leave us a lot of work this evening. There's one resident member and one select board member. I think those are the only two we're picking. Correct. Yep. Oh, yeah. John, you want to walk us through where we sure. are? Sure. John Marshall, uh, Assistant Town Administrator. So um, starting off with the Long-Term Capital Planning Committee, uh, if you turn the page from where the charge sheet is, uh, you'll see an uh, um, uh, Excel-type document that lists the um, members that were recommended by the various boards to, uh, for the select board to make official, um, as well as a few that we're still waiting to hear back from. Um, and then, uh, as you had mentioned, Tom, the um, select board member appointment and the resident appointment. I don't think we have to make them official. If we have a, a capital, two capital budget committee slots, they just appoint people. I think we voted to make it their slot. We're not picking them, right? Yeah. You know, we generally that's no, right, you are. right? No, so, you're so appointing. It, yeah. You're appointing the committee. There are two members from the capital budget committee. On. No, I mean, I don't have, I mean, I, I, 
They pay but, te but technically, if they wanted to swap out their appointee, are they permitted to do that without, or do we then have to reappoint? We'd have to reappoint. Okay. This is a select board recommendation. I mean, I don't have any problem just, you know, papering it over with a vote. Yep. But, I mean, I don't have a problem with any. And the Warren Committee, I was there last week. They were, disc they, uh, the chair had asked for people who were interested to submit names, so they haven't made that appointment yet, or that, that recommendation yet. And likewise, the Community Preservation Committee, we're also waiting on a uh, member, and the Energy Committee, we're waiting on a member. I should note in our pro when we discussed this earlier, we talked about um, interviewing the resident uh, before we made that um, appointment. I think we did. That, was that, that sounds that correct. Was a, that was a discussion. I think we'd said this was too important. Yep. Well, actually, I had a question about that. Given the uh, importance of this committee, uh, if we have only one applicant at this point, Hence the, the need or, to do um, the interview. <laughs> but, you know. Well, if we have only one applicant for the resident slot, I'm wondering if we should be, if we should promote it more actively. So we have had it advertised um, for a month on the town website on the main page. Um, I believe we got information out through the local media, um, but we can certainly uh, try to make another push uh, for it um, to have a few applicants um, and circle back with you. Yeah, it would be worth that, trying yeah. if. if yeah. Uh, and then maybe then contact Ms. Wang and have her come to a meeting for an interview along with anyone else who may. Yeah, I, I, show I, up. I, I agree. I mean, I, I liked her background at least. I mean, she you sounded know, great. I mean, exactly we could we so could interview her and she could be perfectly fine. But you're right. You like to have more than one choice. But if she if she works out perfectly well and yep. like you said on paper it looks perfect. Yeah. So well, why don't we? I mean, let's advertise it again. Let's yeah, see what see if we can drum up additional interest and we don't need it would be ideal it. to have a couple of choices. But if not. You should um, ask Ellen to send it over to her town meeting rep database people. Didn't she? I don't think she, I don't think she did. I'm not sure that one went to. I didn't you can ask anything. her. She'll know. But I don't know if that went to town meeting. Town I meeting know it went on some of the town listservs. I saw it. Yeah. I don't know if I saw it going to town meeting. Yeah, town meeting members. I mean, I've been talking it up to people, but obviously it hasn't worked. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> it sounds too daunting. Um, I've been waiting for you to pick the select board member to be on. Yeah. <laughs> well, that we can do. <laughs> Who do I have to work with? That we can do. Yes, yeah, so people <laughs> to choose from. So, so we should uh, we should actually. Uh, I think there will be sufficient membership that I think we could actually make this appointment, and they could get going. But we should figure out who from the select board would like to participate. Do we have a volunteer? On the capital budget committee, I could do it. Yeah, I mean. Uh, uh, I'm feeling between the various committees right now a bit uh, a bit stretched. If you're a high school building committee, well, I think for the chair committee. it would be it would be a lot, and considering the chair and then the next chair, it would probably not be the the choice position for them to be on. Yeah. So if you, if you are willing to do it, I think that would be great. I don't know if Roy's clamoring to. I'm not clamoring to do it as someone. No, I appreciate as a that. burning desire. I'm just offering to do it because I'm on I, capital budget anyway. I think it would be fantastic. Uh, I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other. I'm happy to do it also, but um, because the DPW and police station will be winding down over you know, before the new committee really gets going. Um, but if you end up chair, you may be sorry you said that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I really don't have a strong feeling one way or the other. Adam, if you want to do it, that's fine. I'm, I'm willing to do it. I'm, I'm doing the capital budget work now anyway, so it sort of fits right in with it. But I mean, I could see some value in having, at least in the first year, the capital budget committee also being the long-term capital planning representative as we try to work out the kinks. And well, you've got two people on there anyway, but it'd be a good liaison. But still, I think, the, yeah. I think that alignment of having... It fits within my liaison yep. work, that's all I'm saying. But um, I'm not looking for extra work if someone else wants to really do it. Well, um, if you want to get started, and if you ever uh, feel that it's necessary to pass uh, pass the torch, I will take it from you. That sounds like a fair a fair uh, request. Sounds good, and, and I do think while these are three-year appointments, uh, we've acknowledged that there may be times where people swap in and out on a yearly basis as responsibilities within the committees change, or if membership within the committee changes. So exactly. Yeah. Do it for a year, and if it turns out that Time to switch it off. We can pick that up. All right, so uh, with that then, why don't we take a look. We should ideally get a motion to approve the existing members. 
I would move to appoint uh, Michael Crowley who wants to the Long-Term Capital Planning Committee. Michael Crowley is the school committee member. Anne Marie Mahoney and Jenny Fallon is the Capital Budget Committee member. Adam Dash, Select Board member. Floyd Carmen, Treasurer. Uh, I guess none of those are ex officio, right? Uh, correct. Those so are we don't those have are to. No, the treasurer is not. Uh, so, tr right, Treasurer Floyd Carmen is not is a voting member actually. Got it. Yep. yep. Um, so those I believe are the only ones because the others are yep. So those are the one, two, three, four, five that we have because we're not doing the resident. We don't have an energy committee person. We don't have a warrant committee or a CPC. Correct. So. Yeah. So how are we working in the terms of these appointments? They all start? Well, that's the thing. You probably want to stagger them, or is the whole thing three years because it's basically three years, and are they going to stick around after three years? Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. It, it depends what happens. Yeah, that's I mean, the, the goal was to make it ultimately an evergreen committee, but I think we acknowledge we wanted to get it going for the first three years and yeah, see if it ultimately was, uh, uh, was effective. You want to stagger yeah. the appointments that way, or no? I mean, you, if you stagger them, then you have the flexibility to have it continue that's what um, I'm saying. So I'm, 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 I'm almost inclined to say let's stagger it, and then obviously we can reappoint people. I'll do the one year. So, all right. So, uh, and, and we should basically yeah. split the capital budget committee members up yeah. as well. So, yeah. maybe we'll do a two and a three. Yeah, Adam, you're a one year. Maybe Jenny two, Anne Marie three. I don't know if they may fight over that, but we'll see. I do Floyd three since he's about to get a three year. Yeah, he's going to get a reappointed. Michael Crowley could be two. Yep. And then we could, you know, the resident, you might want to do one just to see how the resident goes. Yep. So. Yeah. That gives us a little. So then we have one, two, three, f four more, which then you would end up with another one, another two. Yeah, and if you did the resident one year. Yeah, resident would be one year, and then you did energy committee. You could do, I don't know, two year, warrant committee, three year, CPC one year, and then you sort of one, two, yeah, three, four, four, five, six, seven, eight, two, nine. So that works out pretty well because you got nine. Two, three, we're yeah, smart. we're smart about that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Sometimes you get lucky. All right, so let me do this again then. Um, for the long term, I move uh, to appoint to the long term capital planning committee Michael Crowley from the school committee for a two year term. Adam Dash, Select Board, one-year term. Capital Budget Committee, Anne-Marie Mahoney for three-year term. Capital Budget Committee, Jenny Fallon for two-year term. Treasurer, Floyd Carmen for a three-year term. Is there a second? Uh, everybody, yeah, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, I am excited to see that committee get going. Yeah. Good. Okay, <clears throat> next up. So the next up is the... Belmont Economic Development Committee. Um, we do have a number of um, residents that have um, submitted for this uh, for the resident seats. There are two resident seats available. Um, there are also um, business owners from Belmont Center, Cushing Square, and Waverly Square for appointment. Um, we still need to have a conversation um, with business owners from those areas to get those appointments. Um, we do have, within the pool, we do have an uh, individual who is a business owner that would be outside of those, those three main districts. So Gabriella Salas? Yes. Yeah. I mean, these three people who, like yes. Emma Thurston, Gabriella Salas, and Wendy Eckend, who were on the, the study committee, I think would be all excellent choices. I they totally they did tremendous you. work. I, yep. I mean, I don't want this to be an even swap from one, just moving the, all the same people over, but to have a good conglomeration from the original would be great. And then you've got Melinda Wang again, but I think we need to see. Cause yeah, I, I think we should want to pull her. Both, yeah, let, well, know? let's yeah, let's hold her and see in the interview. Maybe she's more appropriate for one versus the other. Exactly, because we have a little flexibility there. But I would, yep. I think Wendy and then Gabriella and, and Emma would be awesome. So I would move all three of them because that would be which, which slots are we? Yeah, talking we're, about? so which well, slots Gabriella would be the business owner outside the three main districts. So that's Salas, and then. Emma Thurston's business is, was outside the district, but it's no longer in business. So now she she would be a resident. And Wendy Etkin, what was her job? She I don't remember. Was, she had retail experience, I believe. On the she what, didn't have a business. She, and have a business she was a, yeah. She was someone we brought in who was a business person not in town, yeah. which was a role that she had, right? She's a resident though. She yes, would be yes, a resident. she's a resident. Yeah. So, so the question of 
if you put those two on, you would be filling both of the residence slots, which I don't necessarily have a problem with. I'm just that would that would freeze out Melinda if you wanted to go that way. Correct. But I don't have a, I mean, again, I think they're both excellent, and they put in a lot and of time. And they have the history with the business study, which is going to be needed. Yeah, well, Melinda right now is also our candidate for the uh, long-term capital, so. And they work out just fine. Ends up so there, yeah. I, I would I would still support strongly Wendy Ekin and Emma Thurston. They did tremendous work on yep. this. And uh, as the two resident slots, and then we can I would see as well. what we get with the others, talk to the business community. So that's, you're going to have to reach out. What you should do is the business study committee, we had a similar makeup, talk to the people on the business study committee from these centers to maybe put out the word like um, Susan Shallow from the uh, beer, from the, the craft beer cellar yep, was like was one great. of the Belmont Center person, uh, the woman uh, from the boutique, what's the name of it? Uh, oh, Hel Helena's yeah, uh, from Cushing, I mean, so, yeah. and then art specialties, uh, art from uh, Waverly Square, if we could talk to them about what maybe if they or other businesses I want could to nominate do. people as well. Yeah. So anyway, I, sorry, if that's comfortable with everybody, I would. I think, I think it is comfortable. I think we probably do need to follow up and try to get those business um, owners in place. Otherwise, they, I don't think the committee can really get its work going. Correct. So. You won't even have a quorum without that yeah, anyway, but we could at least cover. You yep. Know. You, know, I, you know, given the need of getting business owners, you know, I, you know, I have uh, you know, I'm happy to support these three, but I'm wondering if we should defer all these appointments until we get our three business owners together. And just do it all. In well, one. the reality is they can't really meet, yeah, right? So, meet. Well, um, to Roy's point, I mean, you certainly could do that. You're not going to yeah. have any harm. On the other hand, uh, if, you know, how these things pile up on our plates, we don't take care of them at some point. So. Although I, w I will say, I think Roy makes a good point here because depending upon the makeup potentially of those business owners, it may mean you want to complement it in a different way with the That's residents. You know? Absolutely. So I, I think it may make sense. I see the wisdom in us waiting. Let's do it all together, and that way we can look at the overall composition of the committee. Like I said, there's no harm. Yeah. yeah. It's not like they can do anything anyway. But I think we do want them up and running sooner rather than later. Yes. This is a big need. Yes. So can you uh, work on that and then yes. come back once we have those? I, those talk I mean, the good news is you've got the people from the study committee who could probably and then the planning board, zoning board, just talk to the chairs. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll look at that one in aggregate um, in a few weeks. And then age-friendly Belmont Advisory Council. I thought we did this. I, one. I had the same reaction. I thought we, we got really did. close we're, on this one, right? Well, so so we have one to a point. So we had um, we had not received anything from oh. Judy Singler. Yeah. So we did receive it, um, and she um, is part of the. Um, Housing trust, so, that's the only so one. could be appointed as everyone else has been appointed. So I would move to Great. appoint Judy Singler as the housing trust member to the Age Friendly Advisory Council. Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Right. So now they're full. Now they're full. Uh, thank you. I take it they're aware of their deadline. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Now they're aware. Okay. So Patrice. You had a quick update on uh, your recommended capital. <laughs> yes. So um, at the warrant committee, two warrant committees ago, we gave them um, the the capital books. We let capital them budget. Know, capital budget. We let them know this is you know my office's recommendation. John did pretty much all the work on this, <laughs> working with the capital budget committee. Um, ultimately, this is the capital budget committee's um, discussion and, and recommendations to town meeting. This is just our work working with the departments and what we think. Um, should be a fun funded given the 1.4 million that is allowed under the um, discretionary capital amount. So I don't know, John, if you want to take it from there. Sure. Yeah. So um, actually, with the capital think budgets uh, budget committee's meeting uh, Thursday morning to start going through the department heads and. Oh, there is over. there is one thing I wanted to, to note. I did meet with the um, Kathy Cohane um, of the library trustees this evening. Um, she expressed some concern because she had two items on the capital uh, request that I had not recommended for um, appropriation. And my reasoning for that was given the fact that they're looking to build um, a new library. And given the need, the great need for capital for other parts of the departments in town, it's felt like we really needed to focus on those issues versus um, the library. I did say to Kathy that I said at the Warren Committee and that I would say here is if the, if the library doesn't, that exclusion doesn't pass, 
um, serious capital would be needed to be invested in the building because of decisions like this. Last year, we, were, we had similar discussions about not putting money into a building that you're about to tear down. Obviously, life-saving um, capital needs we would recommend, but we felt that the, the capital request um, could be deferred until the decision of a new building was decided. So that's pretty much it in terms of some thinking that we had going into capital items. Mm -hmm. So th there's just over, in discretionary requests, there's just over $2 million um, of items. Um, we have one million four seventy five uh, two sixty eight available. Sorry, John, is that a tab in the notebook? No, that's is the that capital the budget. You're looking at the actual yeah. budget. Sorry, I, I can. I think we may have sent this out electronically, and I think we may have given books. But I'll, if you don't, I'll, I'll make sure. Fine. I just read through yep. it then. So, so just from a really um, high level, um, you know, we have more requests than we have funding available. Um, there are a number of items that have come up the last couple of years that we feel they're important to at least uh, partially fund in this year, even though they can't be fully funded. Um, one of probably the main ones is the um, fuel tanks at the Public Works Department. Those are uh, single-walled tanks that are buried in the ground. They no longer meet code. Um, Last year when I had started with the town, it was on the requests, and I think it was deferred from the year before. It's up again this year, and I think at some point we just have to tackle it, even if it's a small amount to get that going. Um, there wouldn't be enough money to fund it in this year, but setting money aside to um, partially fund it, recognizing that the following year, hopefully we can get the money to fully fund it. It's a two-step process, uh, and unfortunately you need all of the money to do both steps because it requires digging out, dealing with any potential remediation that has to happen with the soil in the area, filling it back in, pouring a slab, and then putting the new tanks that would be above ground. Um, yeah, don't put them under anyway. Yeah. There are a number of equipment requests that we have. This is you know, part of um, trying to timely replace the um, vehicles and different equipment that we have in town. Um, there are a couple of items that um, Patrice and I, in meeting with the departments, we recommended deferring to a couple of years out. Um, they were towards the end of their useful life, but we were hoping we could squeak through with another year. Um, I know that the facilities department was looking for a vehicle um, for um, some of the staffing that they have and being able to be more efficient with that. Um, the thought is to try to work with the DPW to try to get them access to an older vehicle that they might be trading out to get through for another year or two. I know that was a potential solution for last year, and we just have to follow up on that. So um, I, I, we changed the way that we did the capital budget this year just a little bit. Uh, I threw a curveball to all the department heads, and they responded very well. Um, but our goal is to have all of this electronic and try to work with the, um, we're working with the IT department so that we can catalog all of the requests within a system so that year over year we can kind of track those requests, see how they're doing, and follow up a little bit differently with them. So um, I just want to say the departments were great in kind of responding to that change. So The other thing is um, under facilities there are a lot of school building requests, mm -hmm. um, the aging infrastructure of the schools is starting to show in wear and tear and there's a lot of requests um, for facilities for school school buildings so we'll go through them still not enough <laughs> yeah well capital <laughs> budget is going to go through them doing the interviews with department heads and all of that and uh, the process starts thursday and is going on for many thursdays right yeah. again this is just our recommendation just to give the capital budget committee a little bit of different yeah. perspective and it's ultimately their decision yeah. so. Ultimately, town meeting's decision. Well, wow. <laughs> yeah. that, that is correct. true. Yeah. That is true. But, uh, but yes. What goes I before town meeting? I don't think town meeting has turned down a capital budget request in a long time. Right. Okay. So there. Excellent. Th and thank you, John. I know uh, when at the Warren Committee a couple weeks ago, uh, folks really appreciated the new format, the thoughtfulness with which you went through it. I think it was a lot of uh, uh, positive acknowledgement of, of that effort. So thank mm -hmm. you very much. Okay, so town administrator's report. Yes, so as the board is aware, at the 2018 annual town meeting, the CPA funded the restoration of the old barn on Mill Street. I'm happy to report that the work has been completed, and I attached some before and after pictures, which are pretty, pretty good. I mean, yeah, I it, did actually. It looks really I, great. 
Was that? I missed that little. Oh drive. yeah, that guy was great. I did drive drive by it the other day and almost almost didn't recognize it. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> like, it's wow, actually, it doesn't look like a dilapidated it like, structure. It looks historical now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a great makeover. Yeah. Um, now next, now we have to do the next phase, which is we have to determine the use. What's the process with that? I haven't heard any updates on that, so I can look into. I think it. that's the next because yeah. the step one was to keep it from falling down. Step yep. two is to figure what we're going to do with it, and step three is to figure out how we can make that happen. Seems like a fine project for the long-term capital committee. <laughs> <laughs> ah, thank you. I, I would take that on. That'd be, that's <laughs> perfect. But no, I love the love the pictures. Yeah, it looks great. Yeah, it really does. It really brings the building back to its glory. It does actually. It's pretty cool. Um, we were informed by the school department. Um, I've attached the memo that for all public school non-employees hired after January first, twenty twenty, who are eligible and choose to enroll in health insurance offered by the town, the employee contribution rate has changed to the following. So the biggest is the HMO plan. The employees will pay 25%, which was previously 20%. And these are non-union employees. So this had nothing Start. to do with what the, with the plan design change? No, nope. this is the contribution split. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. This does bring the schools in line with the town, correct, in this regard? Yes, for the non-union, yes. Non -union. One of the discrepancies for non-union yeah. employees right. was that, yeah. Right. So I think that's actually a So good step. the change in contribution will garner savings over the years as employees rotate in and out. So obviously as people come in and out, the new employees will be on a 75-25 split, so you'll start to see a little bit of savings. Mm -hmm. but how does this work? This, is, this only applies to new, em, new employees yes. after January 1. Correct. So, so everybody else is grandfathered at that point. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the teachers are still 80-20. So it's all public school non-employees. Mm -hmm. non so non-union. Non non-union. Non 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 I was like, why are you paying union non-employees? So. Yeah. <laughs> non-union non employees. That's a good gig. So, um, okay. So we finalized our marijuana process and pre-screening form and have distributed the document out to prospective candidates. Town Council reviewed the final document. Once we receive a complete pre-screening form back from the candidates, we will work with the select board to determine the next steps. As of today, there have been only two candidates that have secured a location and met with the town. So I attached that form. But no applications yet? No, nothing completed. Yeah. I went through this form, it looks good. Um, looks like what we're seeing in other communities. I think it passes muster with the host community rules. And yep, the other thing I wanted to note is I talked to George about people that call in requesting, you know, what the process is. We would give them the pre-screening form but also let them um, know that there are other applicants or candidates in front of them. So mm -hmm. we disclose that Whatever it is, but it's yeah. not a first come first serve type of type of thing, but there are people that have paperwork in. But yeah, what obligation do we have? Can we consider other applicants right up until we sign an agreement with one? I believe so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have any applicants yet. So. Right. Um, stakeholders from the town participated in an all-day workshop for the Municipal Vulnerability Program, MVP. Uh, the town has recently been involved in. The goal is for the town to become an MVP certified community, which will enable the town to apply for state and federal grants to address climate change impact projects throughout town. The workshop was heavily attended from Belmont residents and staff along with regional representation. A report will be generated by the Weston and Sampson on the work done at the workshop. And I want to thank John Marshall for pulling the stakeholder workshop together. So yeah, I participated in that. It was great. It was yeah, huge. It was yeah. Big turnout and we went, th it was hours, many hours. We went through a lot of, um, oh, Phil Ferris here, he, say, he yeah. was there as well. We went through a, a whole big, uh, big with the chart and putting stickers and going through everything, coming up with the priorities and broke up the groups and came back together and it was really good cross-section of town uh, to figure out what we can do to deal with rising sea levels and increased storms and how Belmont goes forward with that and the ability to get money, obviously, to go, go through this process. It was nice that someone from Arlington Planning came who had been through the process and already has gotten through it to sort of help us, you know. I sat next to her to listen. Yeah, <laughs> intently like, there all yeah all you sort of ask questions because they've been through this before. Yeah, that's great. Um, I did have one other item that I wanted to just discuss real briefly. Um, now that John's the administrative assistant, there are some times where I take days off on a Thursday or a Friday and the, when the expense warrants needs to be signed. And I didn't know, we didn't want to wait for a meeting of the board to make him acting. So, and then looking forward, there are days that, you know, I kind of want to take off and they kind of come up sporadically. So I kind of wanted to, gauge if, if the board is inclined to always vote John in as acting or just have me appoint him as acting if I'm going to be away for a few days. Sorry, for, for what purpose or for? If I'm going purpose? away for a couple of days yeah. and there's really no board meeting but it kind of comes up, sp you know, spontaneously. To make John as long as I, yeah. Right, yeah. and as long if as what, I know if, what, if I. Sorry, if what comes up, is, are you talking about something specific or life in general? 
life in general. No, I'm talking about if, I, if I'm burnt out and I just need a couple days. <laughs> so okay, but to make John acting town administrator right. to act on Patrice's capacity while she's on vacation. And the way we do it now is if I have a week that I know I'm not going to be here or I'm going to be out of town, I bring it to the board, you make John acting. And what I'm noticing is, at least for my summer coming up, there looks like there might be days where I don't know if I can, if I am going away or if I'm not going away. And we just kind of want to talk, figure out that process. I mean, it makes sense. The assistant town administrator traditionally takes on the acting role. We usually have to vote it. Right. And there have been times when we had no assistant town administrator where we made Glenn Clancy, we appointed him. Yep. But you could, you could set a, we could set a policy now that you know the act the assistant town administrator shall be the acting town administrator in the absence of the acting town administrator and that i notify the chair in advance of that i was gonna say i think we should probably define what absence right you know if yeah. you take a half an afternoon off like i don't think that's no what i was thinking and about is two consecutive I'm, days and you've notified the chair i mean there ought to be something or if i leave the state for right. a couple of days something like that you just write up write something up and then we yeah. can vote on I mean, it yeah i think that, that would be good if there right, was great. something that just write up a policy okay. or add it to our select yep, board policy great. or something. And then that way I don't have to worry about always coming yeah. before you guys. Okay. It's been along the lines of what I said, but you know. Like I think I think to Tom's point, the yeah, I mean, we need to be clear what that means. The other right. thing is in, in previous towns too is I don't like to publicly make it known that I'm not gonna be around because it's so easy to figure out where I am in terms of my residency. Got it. Okay. So anything else? Okay. Nope. Liaison reports. Well, it's been to a lot of stuff. Went to the Warren Committee last week. Thank we you. I, I appreciate that. I was well, traveling. Fine. Been a long time. It was the shortest meeting. It was 45 minutes. It's the shortest Warren Committee meeting. So the, the guy one Warren Committee meeting I miss is a 45-minute Warren yeah. Committee. Yeah. John and I were there as the B team. I love that. <laughs> he told me that the next day I couldn't stop laughing. It was great. Yeah, and um, the assessors came, and uh, it was a very big uh, presentation about the uh, tax bills because people obviously have concerns and surprise about the size of the tax bills. And uh, Mr. Reard and Mr. Dargan were there, and they gave a very good um, presentation about that. If anyone's interested, um, you could go on the Belmont Media Center and look at the uh, Warrant Committee meeting of last week, um, January, whatever that was, <laughs> last week of January. Um, and it was a good explanation about the tax bills and how they were generated and what, you know, what, where the numbers came from. Um, That's great. Capital Budget Committee we met. We set up our department head meetings. We're starting on the 6th of uh, February with fire and police. And um, the proposed capital budget, as you know, is out. Uh, the rec commission we already discussed about. Municipal vulnerability we already discussed. I had a question about the audit that we got. Because mm -hmm. um, the audit had recommendations to improve some internal controls. And I didn't know. They weren't like major things. But I didn't know if those were being explored and implemented. So what I usually do after the audit comes out is I have the finance team meet and we kind of go through the the management letter and the recommendations and to see if there's anything we can do because they had like a binder with a yep. series of i mean nothing was major but there they was weren't material I don't think, yeah right? so we have to schedule that finance team meeting i mean they said it was a clean audit but yeah. the and i actually ran into uh, craig peacock at the <laughs> uh, mma conference and uh, he and i had a good discussion about it and he assured me everything was fine but there they have these little tweaks and things yep. that are worth internal yeah. control best practices that Absolutely. are worth uh Implementing, I just wanted to bring that up. Yep. Okay. Great point. Reports? Uh, uh, nothing big. DPW still has not uh, entered service in the new building, but we're having a walkthrough in the next week or two, and yep. hopefully that. When's will the ribbon cutting? Do you know? Um, soon. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, otherwise. Get on a warm day. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, the. CPC has approved uh, um, projects to recommend the town meeting, so those are moving forward. And uh, the uh, there's no news on the community path. We're still waiting for the um, engineer to let us know when there will be a date when they can have a public meeting. Yep. Hmm. Is that soon? Uh, I wouldn't say at this point. No. Huh. We're trying to get meeting with the MBTA, so there's, we are kind of going through that right now. It's turning out to be a pretty complicated ask of the MBTA and how long it will take. Um, I just, at this point, the timing is up in the air because if we 
defer a public meeting until there's a conclusive decision by the MBTA. MBTA, we may be waiting a long time. The MBTA is notoriously slow to make decisions on anything. Well, this is, these are some pretty complicated issues and uh, the MBTA, I expect, would take some time to decide in any event, but it, the whole process is just taking longer. The intent is still to complete 25% design by late spring, early summer, but it sounds like that's going to become a bigger and bigger challenge as time goes on. But we have not heard from the engineer at this point since December. A report supposed to be generated um, within the next week or two, so hopefully we'll get something within the next couple weeks. Let's keep we'll us see. updated because yeah, that's, that's a big, big deal project. But the, the meeting with the MBTA is, is And cool. particularly the tunnel under the tracks with the tennis courts obviously is a big hot button issue, so that yes. needs to happen. Yeah, we all yeah. understand that, but yeah. the, uh, it's, it's, it's really the ball is in the MBTA's court well, and the engineer yeah. is doing all they can to well, yeah, we get some help from Mr. Rogers. Mr. So I, I, yeah, we, we're kind of using that as a sales last resort type thing. Um, okay. we, we're trying to work the, the channels through the, um, the mass trails and our project manager, Michael Japanier, to kind of push that along to meet with the MBTA yeah, before I could, we bring uh, in our reps. I mean, I would imagine that the MBTA needs to be heavily involved if you're going to cut a hole under their tracks, right. but still. Um, well, it, it may be even more complicated than that. Yeah. Yeah, that's the part of the issue. Right. Hmm. Well, nothing's impossible. <laughs> uh, <coughs> we talked about Financial Task Force 2 update uh, earlier, so um, work continues there. Uh, high School Building Committee, just two meetings this week. Um, <coughs> it's a relatively big week. Uh, the Wednesday meeting is, um, I'd say, much more of a kind of standard business meeting. Um, we'll be selecting a couple materials uh, and also going through our typical monthly uh, approval process. Friday, though, is going to be a very important meeting where we will find out whether or not the project uh, will ultimately stay on budget. Wow. So on Thursday, we are see, we're opening, I think, is it Wednesday afternoon or Thursday? They're opening all the bids. Um, at that point, we'll actually be able to add it all up and see whether or not when you take all the lowest bidders and you add it all up, does the amount of the cost kind of equal the budget? And that's what the Friday conversation will be yeah, about. That is a, so yeah. it's, gonna be, it's a big one. That's a nerve-wracking process. Very much of a nerve-wracking process. The good news is I think a lot of work went into bringing a large number of potential bidders to the table, and obviously that's a good thing. So, uh, so hopefully, uh, knock on wood, that uh, that comes out in the way that we hope. Do you want to have a link showing up? What's that? Oh, uh, yeah. We had one. Um, we had a rink meeting. Um, any prospective bidder? I think it was last Wednesday or Tuesday. We had one. Um, interested party show up, so. Which is good, is that better than no yeah, interested absolutely. party showing up? <laughs> that is very good to hear. And was, I can't remember, did we make that a mandatory meeting? It was not, right? No. no. Okay, it's so it's, it's possible that there are others, but. If someone's familiar with the pro, with the rink or familiar with the site, they may not have been able to skip the meeting. Right. How, many, how many requests were there for the RFP? Um, so I believe right now we have um, the one, but it is the RFP is out and is online. So um, it may be possible that at this point people are looking at it and they have the information, but um, I believe um, one has only been in contact with uh, Jeffrey Wheeler. Okay. And they don't have to formally request it, do they? Because it's online, I don't believe that they do. No, it's just that for the um, DPW and police station bit, I think we tracked something like 50 or 60 downloads of the packet, it turned out that that didn't really map into the number of bidders, but right. <laughs> everyone on the committee was, was one of them, right? Exactly. Yeah. I've, downloaded, I've downloaded it three times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, it's hard to say until the yeah. bids come in. It's no, it's great. Say. It's great that we had at least one participant in that. Uh, and they, br and they brought team. someone with them, right? So it was, it wasn't just like one person showed up. So. Good. Yeah. Excellent. All right, I think that's it on the liaison reports. Uh, we have a whole stack of minutes to go through. I have a couple of changes on a couple of these. Um, Should we go through, let's go through them one by one then? Yeah. October 11th, 2019 executive sessions, short and sweet and fine. Look good to me. Um, move approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I have some changes to December 2nd, 2019 regular meeting revised. Yep. Um, on the second page under the handicapped parking space argument, I guess this is a larger question. 
Because right here it says, this was about the handicapped spaces in front of the Payson Park Church. Yep. And it said vote passed two to one. I don't know, do we want to call out who voted which way, or do you want to just leave it to a split vote, a split vote? I mean, it's rare that it happens, but I was noticing it, and I didn't know if you wanted to call it out or not. I, I'm kind of not clear one way or the other how well, I that, feel about it. That, that, that's a good point. I, I think in, in general, if it's not unanimous, that we should, get, we should identify would, who voted which way. I would think so. Way. I mean, it's certainly a matter of the public record. You can see it on video. It's not a secret, that's what I'm saying. Secret, I just yeah. don't, for yeah, purposes. Especially in the, fir the first bullet identifies the... <laughs> well, I think you could figure it out from the context of the discussion, but I but think... But that's not always the case. I would think no, it should be called out. I, I, I think as a general matter, if it's a split vote, then um, okay. the so vote I guess should be identified. I uh, I, I don't, yeah, I don't know if you call, I, don't, I hadn't, didn't know if it was a trend or that was just, I, yeah, normally I, I can actually give you an update on that if you want to hear. Um, we're actually, so we received $20,000 um, through a grant to look at um, developing an ADA transition plan, hmm. which will eventually get us access to ADA money. Um, we met with a consultant and we're putting in that plan um, some type of criteria so the board can help evaluate whether or not a, a, a handicapped spot should be placed on the street, which was one of the issues in yeah, what yeah. you're talking about, so. Okay. Great. Right. And then the other, I'm can, can I just clarify right in that same spot, uh, I see that there was a change made, the change made sense, but then it wasn't clear to me what the next line is then. So the, the red line says, he pointed out that the resident at 371 Belmont Street has a driveway, period. And then it says necessary to access the trade-offs involved. So what was that? Yeah, oh, that's it, a it, fair it's, point. That, it, yeah. It's unclear how that next sentence transitions from the previous. Yeah, sentence. I think these were all comments that I made at the time. And I, the red line language of the insert there is something I suggested when we last discussed these minutes. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we should just make, or propose that we just make a, a sentence so that he further stated that yeah. it was necessary yeah, or and, <laughs> yeah. yeah, or and, or and that it was and uh, and and, and necessary to access the necessary. trade offs involved. Yeah, what does trade offs involved mean now? And necessary to access the trade offs involved. Does that make sense? Well, he talks about yeah, property owners the option to make modifications to their property extremes. I mean, that's what he was talking about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess if you put an and there, it's a little little unclear. But you follow what we're saying, Chris. And then I had something on the uh, uh, page, uh, one, two, three, four, uh, five, six. And this is the number of parking spaces thing where it says 75. I guess it was supposed to be 76 about the spaces in the Claflin Street lot. Yeah, I can't remember if it was, I can't remember if it was 76 though or if it was 74. That doesn't really sound yeah. Yeah. I don't know, but. Well, it sounds like 76 is the correct number. Sounds like that's the yeah. Might as well fix yeah. it. May as well fix it. Yeah. So other than those edits, I was fine with those minutes. Okay. Yep, looked good to me. Approval of December 2nd, 2019, regular meeting revised uh, as amended. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Excuse me. December 9th, regular meeting. I have something. Let me find it. Oh, some. Couple of minor, uh, minor little nits. One, two, three, four, five. Page six, about a third of the way down. It says, uh, "Mr. Dash asked him to explain his stressful situation in job and how he handled it." I think I meant in his job. I didn't take those, so you'll have to send me through. Ah, okay. Yeah. Well, then I can give this to you because there, there are three, mostly just typos. There's a missing period in one, and on the last page, um, about the James McIsaac and the contract. It was. We voted the contract subject to the successful completion of contract negotiations. It just says subject to contract negotiations. But you can, yep. other than that, I was fine with it. Uh, I had a couple of nits. Well, first thing, um, uh, Chris, in general, is it your practice to paginate the minutes? The, these minutes, December 9th minutes are, are especially long, but they're not paginated. So that Oh, I see. Yeah, just Shauna did those. Oh, yeah. oh Shauna, okay. Can, well, we can we send some edits then on that maybe? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have some nits too. They're, they're mostly... Yeah, just I just gave mine to Patrice. Family. You want to give them to Patrice? Or yeah, I'll, I'll email yeah. them to you when I get back. Yeah. Okay, yeah. We don't have to vote though tonight. Yeah, let's not vote these. Yeah. Okay. Next set. September 16th, 2019. 16th. Regular is fine by me. 
Good to me. Um, Move approval the December 16th, 2019 regular session minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm also fine with the executive session of that night. Uh, move approval the December 16th, 2019 executive session minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, fine with the exe executive session of December 18th. Uh, move approval the December 18th, 2019 executive session minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 January 7th, 2020, I did have a couple of things here. I believe at the front page, I think Kate Bowen spells her name. I, like I was about to page. say exactly, um, yep. Then you get over to the next page, the first motion to approve the rink. It says dated January 7th, should say 2020. <laughs> Good catch. Um, and then the top of the following page, the board thanked the, uh, the Allisons for the gift and accepted the gift. We actually, the vote was to accept I, the sorry, gift. Sorry, where are you? Uh, the next, the third page at the top in the vote. Yeah. It just says we thank them, but we actually voted to accept the gift. It's true. Yep. Um, yeah. Going down to a discussion and possible ratification of police chief contract, it says Jessica Porter explained that modulo, some minor revisions, I don't know what that's supposed to be. Modulo, yeah. Uh, after? <laughs> after some minor revisions, I think maybe it was Sorry, a bit. Kind of oh, is it? <laughs> no. Is that a real word? If I, yeah, modulo. Oh. It, it, no, it, 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 it is actually. All right, well, you caught me on one then. Yeah. Like when you do modulo revisions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could we say like that after some minor revisions, the board had reached a <laughs> Yeah, let's not use Latin if we don't have to. <laughs> I have no problem as a lawyer with Latin. I just had never heard that one. See, I, read through, I read through it and didn't think twice about it. <laughs> I, I, I learned something new every day here. Um, and then down the next paragraph, about the, it says the motion to execute the employment agreement. Should say under the parameters outlined with a D. Mm, the vote, good catch. The vote passed. That was it. Yeah, no looks. You follow me, Chris? Uh, the, the, the accepted the gift part? Yeah. Okay. And so we vote that, oh, it's in there is fine. They just put and accepted said gift. Okay. We did thank them, but <laughs> that wasn't the official vote. Modulo, I got to use that one. <laughs> Where are you at, John? Uh, very well, Mike. <laughs> All right, so last, what do we have left here? I would move here? approval of the uh, January 7th, 2020 regular mini meeting minutes as amended. Well, actually, I had an issue with January 7th, but uh, since uh, this one was not on video, so we don't have a... You mean the executive session or the... Oh, sorry. Because or, or we're looking at right now at the, um, the regular, regular session. Regular session? No, the regular session, I'm fine. Okay, so. great. So you want to second that? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Executive, executive session, session number one and number two, January 7th, 2020. I didn't have any issue. I'd be careful when you talk about executive session minutes on camera, too, because we can't talk about the substance of it. Well, this is the one. Uh, <laughs> you could submit changes, and we could deal with it another time if you want, unless it's a, a nit or something. No, no, it's not a nit, actually, so... Uh, if we can't, if I can't, if it's not appropriate to discuss the change on camera, then I will submit it to sure. Patrice and we can talk about it. Which was one? That, which was that? The first one. On the Imagine you would. First one, but I guess these executive sessions should also be labeled so we know which is yeah. which. Oh, yeah. So it'll be the first one in the, in the, in the binder. Great. Okay. Okay. So that one we will follow up separately, send, send the comments in to guest Patrice and Chris, and then they can. Yeah. Put a revised version out. Um, January 13th, 2020, regular minutes. I only had a question on the page three under approval for the Grand Lodge. It says Kathy Young, and then it says a question mark name. Is that, do you want to leave that in there, or do we, did we get the name? Is that just a placeholder? I didn't get the name. Okay. Do you remember? Does anyone remember who was there? What was her name again? Oh. The person from the Grand, from the Grand Lodge of Masters, the, the Italian American Club, the one right. that came. Yeah, we'd have to go back to the binder and get her yeah. name. Yeah, no idea. We should, we should probably get it. It was in the binder, yeah. But I. Is that it for the third? For the that third was all one? I had, yeah. Yeah, I had a, an addition actually on the paragraph bef above that says update on service impact from, from potential McLean development. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I had also asked as part of the 
preparation of that report that we get input from the assessor? Yes. The property tax yep. impact, which I, I know we're doing, but I'd like it to be part of the minutes as well, and the assessor is not mentioned here. Okay. Yeah, no objection. We could vote to do this pending, with that change and pending getting the, the name of the person, or we could just punt, punt it till next time. Yeah, let's. I'll send some yeah, language. Yeah, say, why don't you, why don't you propose some language? Yeah. All right. But we got That's most it. of them. We got a good chunk of them. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Progress. Yeah, this was huge. Well, we're staying I, up on top of stuff, so this yeah. is great. Minimal. I will also note, and I think, Chris, you put this in one of your updates, um, the new update in Belmont Media Center where you can see it's, it's now broken out into sections. Yep. And you can actually click through to a particular section based upon the agenda. It's great. On the yes. video. On and the it's video. closed captions. And it's, and it's closed captions. They don't always get the closed captioning right. No. But. No, it's a program. Um, yeah. You can, you can kind of help the program by teaching it all the time. Really. Yeah, they do that oh, on YouTube and it gets it wrong all the time. Yeah. yeah. No, but it's, I mean, they're definite enhancements. It's really yes. great. Exactly. I think the ability to, to deep link into a particular part is so much better than the old. What's it talking about? Okay, look at the agenda. Try to move on. So it's it's actually great. Yeah, it actually makes the video searchable in a real way. In a, in a real way. Yeah. yeah, terrific. All right, we need. It's nine o'clock. One minute of nine. We need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. A second. All in favor. Aye. Aye.